I'm your speaker, Don Gilman, and I've worked on a couple of things over the years. I'm going to talk about four of probably the best well-known, but not all of them. I've got a couple other credits above and beyond that. And although I started in my early 20s doing video games with a bunch of uh, underutilized uh, smart folks down in Col Bryan College Station, Texas, I have gone on to a more respectable career uh, basically bringing magic from the skies. So who here has flown on Delta Airlines, United Airlines, or American Airlines recently and used their Wi-Fi? Show of hands. I helped make that happen. So my teams, and Delta does it for free, right? So the teams that I have helped manage or coach were either involved or created parts of that technology stack, and now I'm doing it for buses and trains. So I've gone from coding in C on 8-bit systems to being a technical program manager at Viasat. So along those lines, been there, seen that, uh, and have the scars, or nightmares, or both. A lot of technology, not going to read slides, but just you can probably pick out a couple of keywords of something you may recognize or don't recognize. And I will post this on my side projects website. I've got business cards up here so you can get the URL later. But, you know, late 70s using terminals to write D&D &D character generation programs and or playing dungeon. You know, that's, that's pretty much the beginning, right? And at Texas A&M, I'm an alumni class of 1984, believe it or not. I was, I was 12 at the time. <laughs> Did have the privilege of doing Fortran 66 on punch cards. So definitely old school. Coded for a good chunk of my career until younger, smarter, faster people came along and they needed someone who is a little anal retentive, a little OCD to organize things, get the billing out, make sure people got paid, kept the lights on. Typical path in IT related things and then moving into actual engineering. And I am a card-carrying licensed engineer as well. Uh, this presentation wouldn't be possible without this cast of characters and a few other names. Some of them are famous. Some of them are, have passed, unfortunately. But the name at the top is the most important name because Gordon was our leader. He was our lead programmer. He was the visionary. And Gordon, unlike the rest of us, is still in the game business. In fact, if you've ever played Star Wars Online, he was the executive producer that shipped that product. It was a mess, and he came in and cleaned it up and shipped it. He's done many other things. I will push to have him speak here next year because he is a great speaker, and I am but a small uh, particle of dust compared to the great gaming greatness that Gordon is. So a couple of things to keep in mind here regarding publishing video games. I have no idea what it's like today, other than it tends to be a multi-million dollar production. I only play two games now. I have other hobbies, other interests. But back then, you would typically get a five-figure advance. In the case of Harpoon, it's almost just over six-figure advance because we were stuck and they, we asked for more money and they felt they were stuck. And, so much for the sunk cost fallacy. Kept shoveling money at us. More on that later. But to pay the bills, we did IT work by day. And the rationale was, think about this for a second. No internet. We're geeks. There are no girls. <laughs> or boys. I think everybody, but anyway. There was nobody to go chase because we were all a bunch of geeks. We loved computers like I think all of you love the same computers, I guess, literally. So we figured, you know, for what these things cost, I mean, Elisa was $10,000 in the 1983 currency, which is times 2.75 now. That's a car, even today, after COVID. That's a car, a new car. The car I drive is less than that, and I drive a nice car. So we figured by making that capital investment, we could get double use out of it by working all day and all night. Geeks, no social life. 
So that's how we started, and we had a couple of several companies. After a little while, we did separate them, so we had more than one going at once. The games had been republished. Some of the screenshots you're going to see will show higher resolution or more current versions from what we originally shipped in the 80s, so just let me own that. It's not consistent. The ones that had the most success being republished, though, were PT-109 and Sub-Battle Simulator. Harpoon was never really republished because it's been in constant publication nonstop since 1989. I get a royalty check today, but it's still in active publication. Every once in a while, I will find it on an abandonware site, and they get a note. Not so fast. Here's the URL for where it's still in print. Take it down, and so far, so good. Except some of the sites have absolutely no way to contact them, and they've hidden who owns the website. But that's another battle for another day. Okay, flashback in time. That was me then. <laughs> this is about 1985. There is a pointer on this? Well, it, there is. Excellent. So you see up here? Who recognizes what that is? It's a manned maneuvering unit, what NASA used for the shuttles, the astronauts on the shuttle. So this is a scale model. Do you then recognize what's next to it? Okay. So how did we do the graphics? Please come in, sit down. They won't bite. I'll watch them. Well, they might B-Y-T-E, but they won't. Anyhow, never mind. Dad joke. It's a dad joke. I can do dad jokes. So when we did Orbiter, the first product, as I'll get into in a minute, we had these ancient computers. Um, this young lady had the hots for one of the programmers. Uh, that's my sister, who was attending A&M. We were mostly Aggies. So we got Lisa's image writer. There's an AT&T 6300 over there. I mean, it's pretty funny. But you're going to see that shuttle again in just a second. Um, you all digging the glasses with the, the fade there? Yeah, so you know it's authentic, right? OK, so historical notes. So my other hobby, they're called rivet counters. I don't get any bad vibes here, so I don't think there's any rivet counters here. But if you see something you know is wrong, make a note. Send me an email. Don't even save it for Q&A. I do want to know. I just don't want to know in the next hour. I will own all my mistakes, all my Googling, and a little bit of ChatGPT, which actually helped a little bit with not the copy, but some of the references, because it was far faster to use ChatGPT to get a collection of what are all the video resolutions that were available in 85? Not what I had on the side of the box, but what else was out there? I don't remember. It's been 35 years. So I used some very current technology to te help tell you about old technology. I know, you're all going to get up and walk out. I'm unpure, right? I've broken. It's not kosher. Yeah, I get it. I get it. So in some cases, 40 years, uh, I felt perfectly legitimate taking screen caps of my products off of abandonware sites to show them again to you for quick reference. So I'm owning it. I'm owning it. And again, after the hour's up, I'll take the corrections. Very, very much so. So Orbiter, 1985. PC, Mac, Atari ST. There's a picture of it. The actual product is over here on the shelf. It was effectively a text-based game in, in some senses. The screenshots are not complete. I couldn't get the emulator to run effectively on the one system that I had available to me. But uh, you can go to the abandonware sites and run the DOS emulators or download it, run it on your ancient PCs and try it out for yourself. But we had four panels that you could load these different screen sets. There's about, um, there was nine screen sets, so then you'd load them into these panels. You didn't have a mouse. We couldn't count on the market having a mouse, so we were all keyboard based, so that's what the codes are. And we had a helper, the computer, the computer on the shuttle, or mission control, depending on your perspective, prompt you as you went along. That's what you saw here. So Orbiter, this is control. Uh, in some cases, the computer, would, the computer would prompt. This agent, this assistant, is a theme that's constant in all the games that we have. So technical notes. Based on my memory, my research, and the label outside of the games that I still have in my possession. <sighs> Y'all familiar with the terms bearskins and stone knives? So pretty much the case. And... The systems we were using weren't really any advanced over the systems we were shooting for, except for the Lisa and the Mac. So the Lisa development kit at the time, you connected a cable 
to the Mac and you compile it on the Lisa and you would shoot the compiled code over to the Mac because the Mac at the time was a 128 and nothing was happening on that baby when it came to compiling. And we actually had a five megabyte hard drive Ooh, on the Lisa, whereas you had 128, sorry, 400K floppies on the, on the Mac. So these are some systems that are in the process of being handed over to our sponsor, the National Video Game Museum. I wish I still had that 128, but we've got some fat Macs as well. And then here's some trivia. How did we research this without the internet? Books. The Texas A&M University Library. Two hour field trips to NASA down at Clear Lake because we were in Bryan College Station. And as I mentioned earlier, our graphics were bitmap graphics. We had no vector processing. You couldn't do a vector, it was all bitmap. So I used paint and draw because draw would basically deposit bitmaps, but I could use that to draw straight lines better than paint. So I was the artist as well as one of the programmers and designers, and I will show you what that looked like in just a second. Fun fact, NASA almost put it in their gift shop. Not, fat, not, not fun fact, Challenger blew up, blew up. Doesn't matter when it happened, it happened, it was horrible. This is a scan of the artwork that went into the game from the Mac. And it's all bitmap on Mac Paint. So I've got about 20 of these sheets. Actually, I've, I have them with me in this box. So I scanned just a couple to show you. It's my only art credit in my gaming development career. And here's a fun fact. This is my other hobby now, is scale models. So I restored this during COVID. The MMU guy didn't make it. Don't know when we lost him, but this I restored, and it was pretty weird working on this because I also have the poster for Harpoon, for Harpoon, I'll get to that. I've got the poster for Orbiter framed, uh, packed away. I just moved houses, and I haven't unpacked it yet. Otherwise, I would have taken a picture of that. But it's basically the front of the Orbiter box without the hologram, and it's a big you know, poster like they used to do in the video game stores. Okay, PT-109, 88, Dawson Mac, also Spectrum Holobyte. Ignore the colors. Ignore the colors. That's just what I was able to get. Again, there's, you know, there's immersive theme. I know this is old school for you here in 2023, but in 84, 85, 86, there wasn't a whole lot to go on. And maybe there was one thing out there and we were inspired by it and copied it, which in the case of Harpoon with the battle sets, yeah, there's something that I'll talk about. But for this, we thought we were being somewhat original. We we're thinking in terms of a movie and a narrator. And that game was about PT boats, and we had designed for all the different places that PT boats existed, and you had your different variations, and a little more immersive. There was that out-the-window view on the orbiter, but you know, at most you'd ever see was a little itty-bitty space station or the, the runway. Here, you're running it. We had, in all of these games, a concept called time compression. Pretty old school now. We think we invented it. We don't know that for a fact. We'll let the PhDs figure that out in the future. And you know, here's this assistant, which is, like I said, pretty common now. General quarters. So are you the captain, or is the captain telling you to do that? OK, little inconsistency there. Map view of the Solomon Islands, which is where PT boats were heavily used in the early part of World War II. Here's your status screen, very familiar thing. Anybody playing any video games? Here's showing another view with binoculars. Jerry Pornell did video game reviews back in the day, and he didn't like our, uh, our binocular views on this or the next game I'm going to show you. I found an old review, and he's like, this is not realistic. Well, yeah, it's a game. <laughs> People call it a simulation. Oh, here's a fun one for you. Uh, <clears throat> back in the 80s, if your game taught somebody any technical fact, any historically accurate fact, it was called a simulation versus a game. Kind of weird. Okay, tech notes. You know, the systems have, have evolved a little bit. The development systems had evolved a little more. There was starting to be a gap there. Uh, we could actually develop on slightly better systems and afford to buy slightly better systems than they had at the time. We still use Lisa's for our design work because the integrated Lisa works worked. Office didn't really exist yet. It was still multi-plan and then Excel 
and VisiCalc, and you know. So at any rate, Lotus One Two Three had come out at that point. Uh, Symphony, I think, was out at that point. So for creative design, the Lisa was the best thing we had available to us. And the reason, by the way, we had three Lisas is that Gordon and I worked at an Apple retailer and we were able to get the machines without the 40% markup that existed in hardware back in the, and back in the day. 40% margin. I was, on, I was selling on commission my last year in college. 40% margin. I actually paid for an entire semester of college selling floppy disks because I had over 100% margin on those. True story. So here we have uh, there some trivia. So PT, the movie PT-109 was our baseline. Where did we get PT-109? From Netflix. No! Blockbuster. <laughs> we designed the system to be modular. We always architected our systems, our products, so that we could do expansions. But that didn't take root until Harpoon. But we tried to. And if our publishers were international at the time, if the internet existed where they were instantly selling internationally, we probably would have done European releases or Asian releases, because the Japanese had PT boats as well. They you know, called them something different. They were e-boats for the Germans, MTBs for the Brits, and um, I, I don't remember what the Japanese called theirs, but they had them. And one fun thing we did here was this training guide instead of a tutorial, because we didn't have disk space to ship a tutorial, and we didn't have budget or, or time either. I wrote a guide which was basically this Nick character teaching you, the prospective PT boat skipper, how to be a PT boat skipper at Melville, which is actually where they did that in, in, New, in New Hampshire. And we had professional artists finally helping us. So the Hombergs were, were uh, discovered when young Dale, at the time was probably 12, 14, yeah, 14, 14. Uh, we'd gone to a computer show, or a, a home show, and, and the a uh, computer store that we still work for part-time had a booth and they wanted us to run the booth. And so we set up the games to show off the computers. I guess it was Orbiter and there was a drawing program and Dale walks up and he starts drawing the most amazing dragon. And Gordon and I looked at each other and were like, hey kid, where'd you learn that? Oh, my mom taught this to me. Oh, wow. Um, your mom here, we want to talk to her. Hi, oh, here, this is Dale Homburg. This is Jimmy Homburg. Um, we need artists for these things, and we're seeing what your son's done. And she goes, yeah, he's gotten into this new media. Well, I do oils, I do watercolors, I do three to Look, you like a part-time job doing video game stuff? Yeah, sure. So they ended up doing like 10 or 15 titles over the years, but it was really funny because uh, we had to put her on the payroll instead of him because he was too young. But anyway, he's now an executive doing uh, learning software, I think, and she's retired. Okay, Sub Battle Simulator, different publisher, Epix. Who remembers Epix? Yeah. A few more platforms, this being the CGA screenshot, obviously. Uh, and, you know, again, this is some of the re-released versions had better graphics. Depends on the platform. Same kind of concept. You're a first-person shooter. It's a little fuzzy. You're, you're driving the vehicle. You're having to make decisions. You've got this interaction from your crew or the captain, depending on what your context is. Okay. Technical notes. So we're getting into more display adapters. Max got color. Development systems continue to spread out. We actually have 20, 30, and 40 megabyte hard disks. Ooh. No network, though. And as noted, we may have actually gone to C++ versus regular C, which we were using at the time. So trivia. We read this pair of books that was very popular in the World War II history crowd called Silent Victory. Every submarine movie we could get at Blockbuster, which is more than you might imagine. We had one of our groupies who'd played Orbiter and 109, or was involved in to, you know, the timeline's a little fuzzy, went to the National Archives. He was an attorney, so he had money to burn. This particular attorney had money to burn. And he went to the archives and he photocopied, because there's no scanners two or three banker boxes full of patrol reports as were officially reported by the skippers to the Navy Department and stuck in the archives and unredacted when they declassified everything. And this was in the early 80s, so he sent that to us. And we were going through those, and at one point I could name most of those, yeah, I could talk about most of those patrols because that was our source material. 
and you know the usual usual books and stuff. Well, one of our members, Mike Jones, who was in the picture, he went on to produce a much better game called U-Boat. Anybody remember U-Boat? Oh, really? Okay, that's fine. Uh, at any rate, that was much better received, sold a lot more copies, and he was a producer on that. And so our folks started here and you know, moved up through the industry. Mike is also a senior executive now with another learning management company. Are you sensing a theme here, education? All right. Some of the interviewing also included the extreme privilege of meeting one of those skippers from World War II, because this is the early 80s. They were still alive. So Slade Cutter, one of the top three scoring sub bases of the US was three hours away in San Antonio. I uh, went to his house. I have a letter written. That's how we reached him, right? We wrote a letter. Sorry. I rehearsed this and forgot to turn off the, the, the advances, so bear with me. So I got to meet with him. He told me some things that weren't in the books. Is that how he remembered it? Or did the book skip something? Hard to say, but it was very, I felt very privileged meeting him. We did some sub visits. Again, we built the game to do other things, but Epix, shockingly, wasn't interested in doing any sort of add-ons. And a real fun one is that architecture was, the architecture we used in all these games was an object-oriented architecture, even before we had C++ to program it in. And that architecture meant that you could, for a reasonable amount of effort, 33% of whatever, whatever the original effort was, invest another 33%, and you get multiplayer. Just the architecture we developed just lent itself to that. I can talk about that later if somebody wants to really geek out with me. But Kesmai, who did Air Warrior, anybody know Air Warrior? Oh, you missed out. It was so immersive, even though it was on dial-up modems at 9600 baud. And you were flying in groups of aircraft in real time from around the world. Lots of funny stories there, including when they decided to do a, a US versus Japanese scenario. And on the chat channel, they realized that the people weren't speaking English, they were speaking Japanese because they were fighting Japanese who got up at 2 o'clock in the morning to fight the Americans. <laughs> Pre-internet, right? So very strange. At any rate, that, that, the redesign didn't get the green light, didn't get funding, was never shipped. Okay, the big kahuna, Harpoon. It's still alive, so if those didn't hear it, Harpoon is still in production today. We shipped the original version in 1989. You can buy the box or you can do a download of this. And it has every version we ever did, including the 1987, 88, I don't remember, it's a long time ago, demos, worthless BS demos at the Consumer Electronics Show. Yes, I know, I'm admitting to you that we did uh, bullshit demos. I, I know that shocks you. you know, smoking marijuana wouldn't shock you, but me telling you we did bullshit demos would probably shock you. So this is still in print. It's still maintained. That one of the products, as you'll see in a minute, is still maintained today by a hardcore aficionado up in Minneapolis. So I think we had all the platforms at that point. Uh, yeah. So, first or second, this applies to all the products. These are things that we might have invented or were successful in getting into the market. We'll wait for somebody to do a PhD on the history of 1980s gaming and they can tell me whether I'm remembering it correctly or not. So there's the, there's the mention of time compression, so speeding up the game to get past the boring parts, space shuttles doing things on orbit, it's a long time before you can change an orbit. PT boat going on patrol, you've got to leave the base and get to the action. Who wants to go through all of that? It could be eight hours. Time compression. Subs, leaving Guam if you're lucky, Honol uh, Pearl Harbor most likely, heaven forbid San Diego, going on patrol in the Pacific. It took them two and a half weeks to get on station. Come on, we'd have a memory leak by then and the system would reboot. <laughs> time compression. <whistles> oh, contact, battle stations. So we used time compression in those games, and it was very, very, very important for Harpoon. Battle sets. We stole this from Microsoft. <laughs> we were inspired by Microsoft. So Flight Simulator. Who's played Flight Simulator? OK. You know those packs they sell for geography and sets of aircraft? We looked at that and said, hmm, since we're restricted in processing power and storage anyway, how can we divide this up? And so we were inspired to do 
maps, which we had to do. <laughs> we had to hand scan our maps as bitmaps on the university's GIS digitizer using actual airplane navigation maps used that were, um, they weren't Mercator projections, they were uh, Lambert Conic conformal projections. And then we had to write code to convert all that to the map displays. So you took one of those maps, um, I've got the battle sets over here on display, and then you say, okay, what are the navies that operate here? And what are their ships? And what are their sensors? And what are their weapons? And what kind of trouble can they get in with each other? And that was a battle set. And we actually trademarked that term. And that's, like I said, we were inspired by Microsoft's flight packs or whatever they were called of the day. Uh, staff assistant, so you heard me talking about the theme, the prompting. Well, here we actually have a character on screen telling you to do things. And then user accessible. We probably weren't the first to do this, but we could have been. So we had a scenario editor and a database editor. And initially, you know, piracy is an issue, as somebody in this room will tell you firsthand. At least one, of, one person in this room will tell you firsthand. And so the thinking was, we have to keep everything tightly controlled. Well, you know didn't work. We all know that. We have to keep everything tightly controlled. We, heaven forbid we allow people to make their own content. Well, after a while, we challenged that with our publisher. You see, our publisher was the one writing the checks who gave us the money up front that we were in debt to. Certain point, the dynamics change. If you've got, already received the money, maybe you're in charge. Something to keep in mind if you ever borrow a large amount from a bank. So we did, we did some, something or other and convinced them to release the scenario editor as an actual product. And that product, as it was originally released, is up against the wall on the cabinet over there. And it sold like hotcakes. It just defeated all common sense. If the game sold, just say, 1,000 units, you wouldn't expect the scenario editor to sell 500. You'd expect it to sell 100. So when one, one of the players, there's some really brilliant people who played our stuff or contributed to it, sat down and said, I can make a scenarios, but I want to make my own units and weapons. I want to put air-to-air -air missiles on a Soviet bomber and put that bomber in the fleet of bombers coming after the carriers and surprise the Tomcats by shooting them down. Real example. And he figured out our encryption key for our database encryption. It was probably only 8-bit anyway. And then, <laughs> because the game data structures for, the, for the, the annexes were originally created in DBase and Microsoft Access and Fox Pro, they had a certain relational structure. That's also a logical way of doing things if you're not running an object-oriented database as you would today, maybe. So he figured out the encryption. He figured out the data structure. He then wrote a database editor you'll see in a minute in Microsoft Access, got the developer kit, made a runtime version, showed it to us, and then said, may I distribute this? Wow. Yeah. As I remember it, he may have distributed it, and then we came after him or something like that. But the deal ended up with, we're going to put your name on it. Oh, here's a, pay a cash payment. Give me, give me the access, the VBA code. And we'll put this in the game. And we ended up, it's bundled in even here today. It's crazy, right? Is it wonderful or is it crazy? But because of this, we think that's the real reason I'm holding an active product all these years later. And I think it's been proven out by the industry as well. That keeping it open keeps more people interested. Your players, if they've got half a brain, are going to create more interesting content than you can. And that's fine. And that's fair. But this was radical back in the 80s and early 90s. So here is the rogues gallery of the Harpoon product line. So this is the original one, and I've got that original game box up there. And then through a long story that will require at least three dark beers <laughs> and proof that all recording devices are off, there's a whole story here with bankruptcies and stuff. So we ended up getting the game back. And at that point, the internet was a thing. So we started self-publishing with attempts at copy protection yeah, right. Uh, and then eventually struck a deal and turned it, turned it all over to uh, this, this company's Matrix Games. And then uh, rolling back to 94, our publisher, who we owed six figures to because of advances and late, just all sorts of messes. And we, we, we were 
No idea how to do engineering, right? We're, we're developers who wanted to do games. I wasn't an engineer then, I am now. So they said, look, we're, we own, sign this, we'll forgive some of the debt, we're going to hire our own developers, we're going to start over. I'm like, fine. And they did it around the corner from where I was living, ironically. And they didn't want any help from yours truly, of course, that's fine. So they shipped Harpoon 2 around 1994. And after a couple of years, when, I, when they went bankrupt, and I got the code back, and Jesse Spears of Spearsoft down in Austin approached me and said, so, you know, Harpoon 2 doesn't really work anymore, certainly doesn't work on the Mac. Um, I might be able to find the source code. Now, why was this an issue? When 360 went bankrupt, they were bought by Intracorp, a whole other story, including the judge taking our source code and saying, you can't have your source code back, Don Gilman. The creditors get it. Federal judge. What? Okay, so after $60,000 in legal bills, whatever, we get, the co we, we get the rights back and we find out that 360 erased all the, or sorry, Intracorp erased all the disks. I have a witness who would swear to it, but there was nobody left to sue, and would you ever win? At any rate, he attested that they took a mag magnet eraser and wiped all of the tape backups off the server. So Jesse knew this. He said, I might, I might know where there's a backup copy. Would you hold me harmless? Would you, any lawyers in the room, what's the term that I'm looking for? Indemnify. indemnify. Thank you. Will you indemnify me? Hell yes. <laughs> a week later, I can get, I've got, a, I've got a, a beta of this thing running on the current Mac operating system. <laughs> okay, let's cut a deal. So Spearsoft was really born. We shipped Harpoon 3. He said, would you, like the, would you like us to convert it back to the PC? I said, we? Who's we? Well, my brother's between jobs, and he's a really wicked PC program. I said, well, if it runs in your family, I'm in. <laughs> you manage them, though. Oh, yes, yeah, your brother, your idea. You manage them. You sell it. So they did, and they brought the game back. So the PC version was the Mac version converted back. Yeah, crazy <laughs> stuff. Crazy stuff. So after a while, um, he wanted to get out of the business. We cut a deal, went over to Matrix Games, which was then bought by uh, these guys in England. And so anyway, that's why I've got these two products here today. So these are existing at the same time, though. And they had different user communities. So if you wanted fast and fun and lightweight and graphical, you went with Harpoon, because this, by then, was a Windows product. On the bottom, as you'll see in the coming slides, hardcore, edgy, retro, even when it was released. What am I talking about? So. DOS and then a Windows app. There was a multiplayer version that almost went to production with, Kez, with the folks who published Kesmai's multiplayer game. That was Genie. So you all know who CompuServe was, right? You all know who AOL is? How about Bix? Byte Computer used to have their own bulletin board system, online system. Genie by General Electric was where this was hosted on an Apollo mini computer. So they had it done, but it, um, whoops. They had it working, but Genie said, we can only do so many simulation games in our product mix, and so we're canceling this even though you're in final beta. I played it, and it was thrilling to actually have fog of war that was generated by a human opponent, sometimes retired naval officers, and not by our AI as we implemented on the systems that we've been talking about. This is all based on this thing called the Harpoon 3rd Edition rules. I should have brought that with me. It's a paper game you play on a tabletop. There's a connection to Tom Clancy and Larry Bond that I'll get to in a minute. And because it's been around so long, uh, we later added ground units. So we had bases you could attack, but then we figured out a way to do tanks and stuff. It was awkward, but it made the game more interesting. And since the database editor, platform editor, scenario editors were shipped with it now, our users went to town. They invested so much work, a problem arose from our community, which I'll get to. And then my pet peeve after all these years, even though I owned it, even though I created the architecture, I programmed part of it, I kept it alive all these years, with most of the work being done by the teams, just I'm the organizer, or disorganizer, search and rescue. Can anybody here tell me the name of a game, or if, have even seen a game, or simulation, where there's a search and rescue activity. Chopper. 
Choplifter? <laughs> no, not that choplifter from... Defender. Oh my God. Okay, I take your point. That's probably... The, I, okay. So here, when you go to modern warfare, people, people are getting shot down and boats are sinking at a prodigious rate. And if you turn on the nuclear option, the game's over in 10 minutes anyway. So you've got people to go after. And if any of you have served in the military, you know about the search and rescue activities and the training we give the pilots and the seamen and the, and the, the hel special helicopters and the specially trained people with the super up-armed helicopters. This is a big deal. I wanted to include it in the game. No one would ever do it. And Tony today, Tony Eschens is the one who maintains this version. To this day, even though I updated the design for him, still says, nah, nobody wants to do it. Yeah, nobody wanted to do a real-time strategy naval game either. Come on, give me some credit, Tony. <laughs> so here we are. Um, uh, there's hope. So this was, uh, you can probably figure it out quicker than I can. I think this is Windows 98. Maybe XP, I don't know. So here it is, the Windows version. Uh, key things to point out is zooming windows and time compression. See that? Time compression. Uh, buttons that kind of somewhat kind of look like a naval console if you've ever seen one. And the multi-map idea. So the multi-map is this, uh, was a tactical map. This is the group map. And there's a strategic map, which was just basically where in the world you are. Because each of these battle sets, we had hand digitized a section of the globe. And the first one shipped with the North Atlantic Gap, GIUK Gap. And when we did the game, Russia was the Soviet Union. Tom Clancy's Red Storm Rising, you're going to come across the border, they're going to take out Iceland. So this is where we did our thing. We used the, the actual symbology from, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for the correction, Mike. We did the actual symbology from NTDS, the Naval Tactical Data Dis Display System. And because of the resolution we had, we started with CGA, right, 32200. Four colors, if you count black and white, let's not go there. So how do you do this? Well, you scale. You first show where that rectangle is on the map, and then you do the group view, which is your task forces, your circle of ships, or the uh, flights of aircraft launching from a base or a base. So it's very high level. It's the, it's, a, it's the admiral or the general's view. And then you can zoom in to the individual units. And so there's a little itty bitty rectangle there. And that's what this map is. And each of them had their own zoom. And so for Harpoon, there was just one set of windows for each, for, for this version of Harpoon. And we had your statistics here in the corner. So on that surface group, it had six ships. It had five helos landed, five helos ready. It's going at 63 degrees. OK, fine. And then you could get more information by pressing display. We also were educational. We were considered a simulation because we showed people more than they already knew. In Harpoon's case, it really was a simulation. So here is the P-3 Orion, now being retired from navies around the world. And it has this radar, an APS-137, and this is how it would go against a PT boat, V-small, the green, the green there. Whoops. Ah! Did I mention I have arthritis? I'm sorry? It's time compression. Yeah, thank you. Good, good call. I have arthritis that's acting up right now, and I'm, a, I'm more clumsy than usual. So small would be a destroyer, large would be a carrier. So radars work against reflected energy. And so the bigger something is, the further away the energy will bounce back and come back, that your detection, your receiver can, can see it. We also had eight different ways you could detect something. Mark one eyeball, infrared, active radar, passive radar, active sonar, passive sonar, and magnetic anomaly detection. The mad boom on the back, there's a little stub on the back of anti-submarine warfare aircraft. Well, you didn't know this if you booted this thing up until you looked at this detailed display and you learned something. People often said, did you license Jane's all the world aircraft? No, we were very careful not to use Jane's exactly because Jane's is often wrong. <gasps> oh, you're with Tom Clancy and Larry Bond. I guess you're right. We synthesize information from multiple sources. Here's a ship. Uh, most of these, these Ticonderogas are now uh, razor blades, actually. Oh, well. So in this case, uh, these are radars against active targets. And you know, there's a weapons display. And you, know, you could get into it and really learn a couple of things. So that was very Windows and friendly. Well, Harpoon 3, they took a different tact. And that was fine. They licensed it back. It was legit. And they took a different tact. Oops. Sorry. So 
learned their lesson. They integrated the scenario editor, the database editor from day one. But you know, they're, this is 80, this is, this is 94. Hard drives are normal. Graphics cards are normal. You can ship on a CD or at least high density floppies, right? So you can do stuff. And vectors are a thing now because of the graphics cards. Whereas the first Harpoon was all bitmap and you, you had to scale in algorithms, it was horrible. So they, digit, they, they bought the CIA database. You can still do this, do this today. And it's a vector map of the entire globe before the big volcanoes mess with the coastlines and stuff, or global warming. So they had the entire world in their product. And they loaded up with all the vehicles, platforms that they could because they had the whole world. So you could do the Indians and the Pakistanis almost on day one when they shipped. We later made it into a multiplayer game, uh, which was interesting. And like I had hinted at before, 360, then Intracorp, and then back to us after we spent enough money with lawyers to make that happen. So look at this interface. I mean, it's very harsh. This is actually what you see in the command center on a Navy ship, literally. Somebody serve? Seen it before? No? Take my word for it? Okay, well, it's, it's true, I'm not, I'm not jazzing you. And they had unlimited numbers of windows and you could zoom unlimited, same symbology. They had more information in their database. They had more information in memory. Here we go. And they could actually do more than hand-drawn bitmaps for when you wanted to look at the ship. So the Hamburgs <laughs> they had done the prior graphics and here they got a license from somebody I think wires, which is a German version of Jane's, and they were able to get the uh, get the pictures, which is cool. And when you wanted a little color in your life, you could customize the display. So you couldn't do that in the other one. So this was a big hit with people. You could change the colors around. Scenario editor was literally built into the game. It wasn't a separate product. It wasn't even a separate executable. It was integrated into the game. I like that feature a lot. And then here's the database editor I was hinting at. Microsoft Access Runtime. So each of the annexes, there was one for missiles, there was one for bombs, there was one for ships, another one for submarines, another. And then separately you had the aircraft, this being a flanker. And then it would then draw from the other ones to load out all the different possible loadouts. You could have 10, 15 loadouts for an aircraft. And then here's, a, that was a list, um, a list of missiles. So these are all the different missiles in the game, and at that point there were 1,400 missiles in the database, mostly provided by the users. We actually published, and I didn't bring them with me, two game packs of scenarios and databases that were produced by the users. We had a contest, and the best 12 made the first, and the next best 12 made the second. So the final Harpoon product was H3 Milsim or a Harpoon 3 Pro. I won't get into all this. I'm going to fly through it because I'll open this up for questions. But we received several hundred thousand dollars from several different military sponsors to do joint R&D with them to add these features to make it usable for training analysts for doing risk management of, of uh, battle tactics or weapon systems to explore just totally off the wall concepts which could be, what if we had a, a bomber that carried air-to-air -air missiles? They were inspired because of what we'd done previously on that one, but as an example, in today's, or the, the defense world from back then, you'd have to pay Rand Corporation hundreds of millions of dollars, whatever, and you'd have to wait months or years. No, I'm going to sit down on my desktop, I'm going to boot up Harpoon Milsim in a secure environment with a disconnected computer from the internet, and I'm going to go in and create a, my own version of this. And then I'm going to run it. In the case of, for those who, who uh, are into this math stuff, Monte Carlo simulation, set the counter to a thousand and let it run a thousand times to see what the results are for this scenario with that platform. Does it win or does it lose when you play it a thousand times? So you could do that. Um, the policy analysis was kind of weird. We had some really strange emails that were very vague, but they came from .gov or .edu addresses, including Rice University, and I cannot remember the name of the place up in Canada. Still using it today. Poli-sci courses were taught, and they used Harpoon, any of the versions, to generate military scenarios to cause political 
scenarios. And then we had the bright idea that Boeing or Northrop Grumman would pay us for product placement. Fail. <laughs> we had GIS systems involved, uh, involved. We had this thing called a VCR. For you youngins, that stands for video cassette recorder. Um, we, could, we literally recorded the game as it played. And then you or an umpire for the multi-user game could scroll the thing back stop the game, edit the game state, and then restart. So if you're trying to make a point to your students in a classroom setting, uh, we could export back into all sorts of formats, including databases. Uh, this is that, that interface looked like. This is taken from a military presentation. Uh, umpire mode, you get in there and you could change stuff around. Um, let's see here. Come on. So you get in there and you could edit stuff. You could play stuff back. It's pretty cool. Customers. People have bought one or more versions of this. And we charged a lot more for this version because if we didn't, they wouldn't think there was any value. I'm not kidding. Oh, this is a game, the military. This is a game. It only costs 50 bucks. Oh, no, it's $5,000 for the first license. Oh, OK, let's talk. <laughs> Your tax dollars at work, or their tax dollars at work. So anyway, so who's who of folks? The last customer was El Salvador. They bought 30 licenses. Not for that. There was a big discount. My proudest one is Sir John Woodard. Anybody know who Sir John is? was? May he rest in peace. Ever hear of the Falklands conflict in the early 80s? Sir John was the admiral who took the Falklands back, or took the Falklands, you know, Malvinas, whatever. Uh, apologies if you're from Argentina. At any rate, Sir John played Harpoon too. And I got to meet him and spend an evening with him. By the way, piece of advice, if you're ever invited to go out on the town with a British naval officer, don't drink. You're not going to keep up with them. <laughs> I was in so much trouble when I got back to the hotel because my wife said, fine, you have a hangover and we're flying back tomorrow. Hope you remember this. Oh, baby, I remembered it. Sir John. Oh, my God, it was great. Uh, technology. So some of these themes carried through all the way. Um, one that may not really get you unless you do low-level programming today or you've been at this for a while. Floating point coprocessors. Who knows what a floating point coprocessor is? Awesome! You're my people! Thank you! <laughs> Boy, that usually falls real flat. We didn't have those until when? 486. Yeah. So we're trying to do three levels of mapping. A globe with units moving across a globe in three dimensions, supersonic, on an 8-bit processor, and then we have to get it to that map view you've selected. Oh, and there's the merge, meaning that the bombers have come in, they've released their missiles, so say it's 24 bombers, they each have six missiles, the Tomcats are up, they each have six missiles, they've all fired at once, and we have to run this in 512K on an 8-bit processor. <laughs> yes, it slowed down, we're not Superman, but imagine all of those things, because we didn't cheat, we, each of those things had their own search algorithm running. So we a really cool thing. It's covered in this book here. There's a chapter in this book where I talk about the search algorithm. We had to do all that with out floating point. Today, we'd use a GPU for the search algorithm and certainly for the numerics. So there you have it. Stories I can tell. Lots of stories being fired from my own harpoon project, Clancy and Bond and the Watergate Hotel, bankruptcies letters of people who we inspired to join the military all over the world. My current boss played harpoon in flight school. He later went on to fly aggressor F-18s at Top Gun. That was awkward conversation. Uh, I've got stories about the online community, both good and bad, the MIT press book. I cannot talk any more about that other than what you see there. And... I was told when going on IT sales call not to admit I was a video game developer because I wouldn't be taken seriously. Thank you very much for your attention. We've got 10 minutes, 10 minutes for Q&A or less, but I'll be, I'll be here all week. I'll be playing here all week. So thank you for your attention. And I need, almost need to take another picture to, to show there's even more than one person who gives a dang about Harpoon or old games. Yes, sir. So was there ever any concern about like this being a secret or getting out to other militaries? Like you were giving them some kind of strategy advantage that, uh, um, that was undue, like with export control? Yes, actually. And we actually <laughs> mistakenly, not my mistake, their mistake, we actually had an EIR-99 designation, if you know what that is. Okay, North, uh, 
Dallas defense contractors, yay. We were allowed to export it without restriction, but we didn't. When the Chinese wanted it, we did two things. No, not available, and made a phone call to DC. Hence the vague reference. All of the data for the commercial products, either we provided or our customers provided it, it was all open source. Ours started with Larry Bond's boxed naval game, which had been vetted by the naval, Office of Naval Intelligence five years previously. Same database that Clancy used for Red Storm Rising. And he got a visit, too, from Defense Intelligence Agency. But his ended with, oh, Mr. Clancy, would you sign our copy of Hunter Red October? <laughs> Larry got grilled for a couple of hours, and he was asked to sign his uh, copy as well, because he'd helped write Red Storm Rising. Well, he helped write Red Storm Rising. So that's what answered that. But when we sold the military versions, they brought them into skiffs, secured compartmentalized areas that were off the grid, off the network, lead walls, all that stuff, and they put their own data in there. So when Northrop Grumman called from Rhode Island saying, we're having problems with this ship we're looking at bidding for the feds, there's a bug. And we went, okay, send me the game save. Send me your database. Um, it's in the skiff. And I'm expected to fix the bug how? Yeah, that's what we thought, but the bot, I got it, you're covered. I said no, you can tell the boss I'm an asshole. Got it. So that's how that was handled. But did the Chinese go buy a commercial copy with editors and use it? Probably. Did the Russians? Probably. I, I don't know. I may never know. The, when we talked to the feds, they were okay with it. Thank you. I'll be around for more if you want.